Hey guys, Montal here, and thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of Let's Be Blunt with Montal, where we bring you all or as much information as we can to help you navigate this space called the cannabis space here in the United States. And I'm so fortunate to be able to come to you from different cities around the country, and right now happen to be talking to you live from Los Angeles, where I've got a guest that I'm so happy to have an opportunity to talk to him and have him share a story with you here on our podcast. He's been, uh, he's a former NFL football player, did a career in the NFL playing for not only the Jacksonville Jaguars, but also two years with the Chicago Bears, and is an admitted cannabis user, and he used cannabis during his football career to help manage some of what would be, I think, the aggressive deterioration from, you know, multiple traumatic brain injuries, you know, and, and, you know, it's a sport that literally is rife with traumatic brain injuries, whether it be mild or moderate, but it happens all the time. And we know that there are neuroprotective qualities to cannabis. And this is a person who figured that out on his own. He's also an advocate for removing cannabis from the list of banned substances in the NFL and other sports so that, you know, participants can at least enjoy the benefit of the neural protection from cannabis and has been out here in the bushes, out here beating the pavement, telling people, let's get real. Let's start to understand that there is protection in cannabis and, and players in the NFL and players in sports should have an opportunity to avail themselves of cannabis if, in fact, they're going to entertain us the way they are. So, guys, Louis, you got to welcome to the show Mr. Eben Britton. Thank you so much, Eben, for being here with us, my friend. Thank you, Montel. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you know, and, you know, I, I think there are a lot of players, and we've heard about the, the big names, some of the names that are literally getting a lot of the press out here that are now starting to admit to their own cannabis use. But this is something you discovered Way back in your early football career, did you not? Yes, definitely. Come on, tell me a little bit about it. Because, you know, I mean, you know, when did you start to recognize that cannabis would have a positive impact on your career? Um, you know, it definitely started in college. And okay. while at that time it wasn't something I used very frequently because of drug testing sure. and the NCAA is very – strict it's very tight you never know you could get tested at any time right for everything from performance enhancing drugs to street drugs like cannabis right. um and so you know that first experience was it was at the end of my freshman season i was a red shirt freshman um i had you know had a long year the freshman year is always the toughest mm -hmm. coming out of high school you know that transition from high school to college football i think is more drastic than the transition from college to the nfl and, and part, why don't you explain part of that reason why because i mean coming out of high school you gotta you know i'm sure that you graduated from high school what did you weigh when you were in high school uh i was six six two seventy two seventy when i got to the to arizona so you roll in Arizona, but they probably wanted you to get up to about Three, 290, 310. 310 exactly. Right. What position were you playing then? Offensive tackle. Come on, man. You gotta yeah. jump up to three ten yeah. and still run, you know, exactly. a four forty. A four four nine forty. So, you know, I mean, that by itself, people don't understand the strain that that puts on your body. Absolutely. Explain it to them a little bit. Tell me, because you when you're lifting weights every day, twice a day. Training your ass off in the weight room, on the practice field. You know, when you red shirt, you're there every day in practice. You're grinding it out. You're mm -hmm. giving the, you know, the first team guys who are going into play every week, you're giving them the look of the team that you're, you're that they're playing against. Right. So it's a grind, you know, and freshman year. And you're year, taking hits, like, right? Taking hits, full speed practice, full pads, four days a week. You're grinding. It's taking a toll on your body, your neck. Every bit of your body hurts, mm. you know, your back, shoulders, hips, feet, knees. It all hurts. And here you talk about the fact that you're you're worried about drug testing, but, and I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not saying this to cast dispersions on anybody, but I'm sure the team doctors are writing a prescription for any opioid you need. Definitely. You know, college at Arizona, it was, you know, the pills didn't really come into play. Okay. Maybe that was just my experience, but I, because I've talked to guys who I played with in the NFL about, 
getting toured all shots when they were in college. Mm-hmm. I never had that. Um, I would maybe take an Advil here and there. Okay. Okay. To, to cure some soreness. But for the most part, pills weren't really part of the picture yet. Okay. All at, right. At my college in, in the system, at least for me. But if you had gone to see a physician and he wrote you a script for one, oh, as long as you had a script, right? It wouldn't definitely. have been something that they would have found upon. Definitely. And I had to I had definitely taken, you know, my fair share of painkillers in college for specific things that would happen. Right. I mean, know? if they saw it on the training film and they saw it on the exactly. tape, they realized, oh, yeah, you could probably use a little yeah, something, something. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And look the other way if that came up positive in your drug test. Yeah, you know, and that's kind of the funny thing is, like, there are these opiates that guys are taking that, you know, are just freely used and prescribed and it's not a big deal. And, you know, they they will back you up if that if you get popped for that on a drug test, et right. cetera, and say that's doctor prescribed. Um, so but but if they have found just a little trace of THC, uh, ah, you're done. Ah, God right. forbid. You know, oh, I was always a team leader. I was a guy who was a team captain. I was a guy that coaches pointed to to be the example for the other players on the Mm -hmm. team so for me i was always interested and kind of curious if you will it was always something i gravitated towards right um but i was always very fearful of using it for that exact reason god forbid a coach find out though you you say you gravitated towards you didn't gravitate it towards didn't gravitate towards it while you were playing during the season but you said until the nfl until the NFL, but and now we'll get to that. All right, but let's let's go back to college though. So at the end of that freshman year, you know, you're figuring I'm away from school for about three months. They can't run a test on me. Well, the older guys, it starts with you know the the older offensive linemen. We had we always had get-togethers. The O mm-hmm. line's the tightest knit group on the team, and so at the end of the year, we had a get-together. Offensive linemen had a bonfire in the backyard, and. One of the guys, some of them were tied in with the drug testing people and mm-hmm. said, hey, we got the clear, the green light. There's no more drug tests this year. We're good until next semester. Uh, so, you know, somebody rolled a joint and sparked it up. And the next thing you know, that's being passed around. And it was great. It was a great bonding experience. Right. It was a great de-stressing you know i felt like a human being again for the first time in probably eight months since i'd gotten there and just was on this grind and i remember that was a great experience itself but what struck me most about it was waking up the next day and feeling i had gotten a great night of sleep there you go i had i felt like all the pain in my body had been soothed Mm. I felt like I could go out and start playing football again. Right. You know, and this was after just one night of, you know, a friendly Jay being passed around in a in an offensive line, you know, get together. And I was just like, man, you know, this is such a different experience from when I've taken pills. Mm-hmm. And I felt, you know, waking up at three o'clock in the morning with withdrawal symptoms, cold sweats and chills. I had done that already. Right. You know, through high school, I had had tiny little surgeries. Like I had a dental surgery in high school, which I was prescribed Vicodin for afterwards. Mm -hmm. I was like 16. Sure. And I remember waking up after three days of prescribed use of those pills, feeling this knifing sensation in my gut, having cold sweats, chills, felt completely out of my body I was irritable and I was I said to my mom like mom I feel terrible going to school that morning Mm -hmm. you know I was I was sad I was full there was this tension in my body a little anger a little anger anger. Mm -hmm. and uh my mom was like oh wow I think that you know my mom is um you know for just for to be completely honest my mom is a recovered addict, okay. over 20 years sober. God bless her. You know, we have such an incredible relationship, and she's been such a big part of my um, understanding of how the body works right. and how to heal the body naturally. And, you know, right away she was like, wow, you know, you're, those are withdrawal symptoms. 
you're experiencing. From the, from the opioids from you the were taking. From the Vicodin, right, got it. And so I remembered that so distinctly. And so juxtaposing that to my experience waking up the next day after smoking some cannabis and thinking, wow, this is something that really rejuvenates me. Mm-hmm. It made my body feel better. It cleared my mind of all the stress and anxiety of, you know, having to prepare to play. You know, gotcha. when you're playing football, like you said, the traumatic brain injuries happen much more than we realize. Right. Much more than is talked about. And, and though they may be super mild traumatic brain exactly. injuries, it's an impact. That impact injury in that brain, when that brain bounces off the side of the skull, it literally is sending as many, you know, healing chemicals up there that it possibly can to see if I can at least get you right. Exactly. And people don't recognize that. They don't know that this yeah. is happening. You know, you, you probably, you know, being an offensive lineman, man, you're down there in the trenches uh, yeah. taking that slap, you yeah. know, so uh, you know, those every play. hits, yeah. Every play. I mean, and that, those are what the study, that's what the studies are telling us now mm-hmm. is offensive linemen are experiencing these subconcussive hits literally 60, 70, 80 times a game, right. you know? And so... For our entertainment, I'm going to throw that out. I got yeah, to. absolutely, you know? man. I appreciate you saying that, you know? And uh, it in conversations with some of my former teammates over the last couple of years, because, you know, you come out of... I came out of my football career, and I was completely devastated. Right. Mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally. Mm -hmm. I had no sense of self. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. You know, I was completely devastated. And, you know, football is a sport in which you're constantly overriding your instincts. Right. You know, and, you know, all of those hits in practice were, it was a crack and I had my bell rung. Right. I was like, that's just part of the game. Right. Looking back, those were concussions. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I mean, I want to say, though we, we're, we're here, let's be blunt with my tone again. I'm coming from, to you from California. And my guess is even Britain, who is, you know, a, a – I'm going to use this term, and I don't say it in an aspersion, but you are typical of the NFL in this sense that, you know – 90% of people who are watching today, and we happen to be recording this, this uh, Let's Be Blunt on a Sunday, 90% of people who are going to be watching the NFL today are going to remember the names of the quarterback. Yeah. They're going to remember the names of the running back. Yeah. They may remember one outside linebacker, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. They may remember the name of the you know, tight end, maybe. Yeah. But I defy someone to call me right now and tell me you can name three of the linemen. Yeah. Yeah. Either on the defensive line or on the offensive line. You can't. Yeah. You know you can't. You're lying to yourself if you claim you can't. And you just looked it up so you could call me and say, I know a name, I know a name. But you really didn't. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is, these are the guys who are in the trenches that help make the entertainment possible. Yeah. There wouldn't be, you know, a a quarterback dropping back right now unless there was an offensive lineman getting smacked upside his head with a punch and a punch and then a hit on the shoulder and then da, 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 just to be able to keep the other lineman off that quarterback to be able to make that throw. Yeah. And, you know, I, I grew up, you know, I'm going to be honest with you, I, I was one of these idiots who loved the sport. I find it entertaining. You know what I mean? Come on, I graduated That's from the great. Naval Academy. I mean, you know, you yeah. had you know Roger Staubach, dude. Come on oh, now. Yeah. If you went to the Naval Academy and you didn't root for the Dallas Cowboys, you were an idiot. Okay? <laughs> you were considered a traitor yeah. to the school. Definitely. But I can't tell you the name of one lineman on the Dallas Cowboys when Roger Staubach played. Yeah. Yet you were the ones that were responsible for the entertainment that I really was seeing. Absolutely. And you know, I want people at home who are listening to really listen in to, and I, I mean, I'm going to tell you, you're not sitting here with a chip on your shoulder. You're not sitting here looking like to me like, you know, you want to disparage the NFL, but you want to be able to tell the truth. And the truth is that this is something that takes its toll on all of those entertainers who tried to please me. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And for parents of, you know, some of these kids that are out there right now that are at the high school level getting ready to transition from high school to college, you got to understand that, you know, your child is making a decision that at the end of the day is not as appreciated as most people think it is. Mm. And at the end of the day, 
after 33, 34, 35, you got another 35 years of life that you got to walk around carrying the brunt yeah. of entertaining me. Yeah. So I really appreciate you just talking about, you know, we were just discussing the fact that, you know, here at the end of your freshman freshman year in college, you're trying to find some relief. Mm. Yeah. And you had another three years of college. Yeah. That drug tests were happening in yeah. every year. So it wasn't like you're smoking a joint after every game. No. Right? No, you couldn't. You couldn't. couldn't. Yeah. So go ahead. Tell me a little bit more. So you, you get through freshman year. You're going back for sophomore year. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, my career started to really take off. I was uh, – I earned the starting job going into my red shirt. My, so my true freshman year, I red shirt, and then they call your second year, your red shirt freshman year. So okay. I was a red shirt freshman in my sophomore year of college. And uh, my career started taking off. Um, you know, I earned the starting job. A lot of people around me started whispering. But, you know, my goal was always to play in the NFL. Mm -hmm. That was always the, my mind's eye's vision of where I was going with this. You know, there was never any doubt in my self of where this was what the end game of this all was <laughs> and so you know people started telling me ed you know if you keep working hard and putting your head down and grinding you'll you'll be playing on sundays mm -hmm. um and so you know that continued throughout my career using cannabis very sparingly you know staying keeping my ear to the ground of when i heard drug tests were ending Michael, gotcha and I was safe for me to start consuming cannabis mm -hmm. because that was a huge part of feeling better yes. during the football season. And I'm going to say to people out there right now listening in again, tuning in to this interview, look up the research yourself. We're not sitting here making claims. Yeah. We're not telling you that XYZ equals XYZ. What I'm going to tell you is that there's enough peer-reviewed written, published documentation out there and also studies that have been done funded by the United States government. Yeah. Let's make sure we make this really clear. Yeah. Over the course of not the last two years, over the last 20 years. Yeah. And in that 20-year period of time, we discerned unequivocally that there are cannabinoids within the cannabis plant that have shown that they have neuroprotected capabilities and properties. We know that for a fact. That's right. Ain't me talking. This is the U.S. government talking. That's Look up right. the U.S. government's patent on CBD, and you will see that it talks about neural yeah. protection yeah. in cannabinoids, and especially CBD. It talks about that openly. Yeah. So why would we not let you use cannabis if you're doing nothing but entertaining me? Uh. I mean, you know, it's like... You know, I, I read something, and someone very recently, a very close friend of mine, very recently told me about the fact that when they started looking back into the diets of gladiators back in Rome, they realized that the diets of gladiators contain, contain a lot of plant-based food. Yes. And I will bet without any hesitation— Though I can't say that I found this factually, but I will bet you that cannabinoids of some sort were part of that plant-based diet of even our gladiators. Definitely, yeah. So if we recognize that then, why do we act so stupid about allowing a person in a contact sport to use cannabinoids now? Money. Yeah, yeah, but dude, I'm telling you, at the end of the day, we know that the money would be better spent on cannabinoids rather than opioids because they would make more productive gladiators on the field. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, I'm sorry, I just got got twisted there no, for a minute. But you know, keep man. keep listening in. No, we're 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 here again. This is all real. Patent yeah. six million six hundred thirty thousand five oh seven. That's it, brother. Cannabinoids is neuroprotectants and antioxidants. You know, and I'm I'm, here, I'm I'm gonna go ahead and pull this up while we're talking. But go ahead and tell me a little bit more about that that sophomore year and the junior year. So I continued through college, and it wasn't really until um, you know, and we would talk about it. Mm -hmm. The players, we talk about, you know, man, I can't wait until we can 
just go smoke some weed. Sure. I can't wait until the drug tests are over so that I can do that. I, you know, and the conversations would be, man, I feel so much better doing that than popping these pills, you know, whether it was Advil or, you know, opiates or, you know, the prescription anti-inflammatories like Cataflam and Indocin, you know, the rumblings amongst in the locker room were that cannabis was all of our preferred source of pain management. Yes. You know, and stress relief and, you know, decompression. And so, that really continued, um, you know, through my college career. I used it sparingly. I was very smart about it. Never wanted to get drug tested and test positive for cannabis just because as a team leader, I couldn't bear the thought of coaches labeling me a stoner. Yeah, yeah. you're a druggie. There's a druggie. Yeah. Yep, gotcha. And so um, that carried its way through until my NFL career. Mm -hmm. Um I was drafted in 2009, drafted by the Jacksonville Jaguars in the second round, 39th overall. Um, and uh, the testing procedure in the NFL is much more, uh, I won't say lenient, but it's much more easy to navigate. Mm -hmm. uh, Performance-enhancing drugs are tested for throughout the year at random. They can do it any time. However, the SOA, or Substance of Abuse Test, is an annual test, which is what cannabis is listed under. Yes. And you have a general idea of when that test is going to happen. Sometime between when you report to your team in April and about the first week of training camp and at the end of July, early August. So you have a general idea of when that test is going to happen. So, you know, you back up about a month and a half before right. that, try to, your best to stay as clean as you can, right? Exactly, exactly. And, and losing the opportunity to relieve yourself of pain, though. Yes. That's what that, okay. Yep. And so, but, but during that period of time, could you have gone out and gotten a doctor to go ahead and write you the scripts for the other things, you know, all the sets, the Percocet, oh, Vicodin, Vicodin, and all that yeah, stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Right? That, a team doctor was prescribing that at that point. So you know, you, you'd have something to be a stopgap yeah. relief measure in between, yeah. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 98% of guys in an NFL locker room are being prescribed one prescription anti-inflammatory or another. These are super powerful anti-inflammatory drugs like Indocin, Cataflam, Celebrex. These things wreak havoc on your digestive system, on your liver and kidneys. Um, and just about every guy in the locker room is taking these on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. You know, I was. I, I was using Cataflam and Indocin. Indocin is something you have to eat when you take it or else it will you know, cause stomach bleeding and ulcers and, you know, there's all kinds of issues that go, come with Indocin mm -hmm. and these other drugs as well. I mean, a lot of them, Vioxx, Celebrex, sure. have been taken off the shelves because Correct. they start killing people. Mm -hmm. um, so just about every guy is taking those. Opiates, the farther along into your NFL career that you get, those start coming in early and earlier in the season. You know, some guys are starting to take things like Vicodin and Oxycontin, uh, you know, during training camp. And that's continuing through the rest of the year. That's through the game. So yeah. I mean, to just, oh, yeah. to, just to be able to make the game on just to be able to make the game on Sunday, Absolutely. you know, you got to take two or three. Right? You're popping a few Vicodin right before the game. You're getting your Toradol shot, which is a powerful anti-inflammatory, which the league actually banned the shots because at one point – through my first three years in the league, you could every guy, just about every guy, would head into the, the training room before the game. There'd be a line into the doctor's office, and guys would be pulling down their football pants to, to expose their butt cheek to get a shot of Toradol in their cheek. Wow. And this stuff was, you know, it made you feel like you could run through a, tra run through a brick wall. You know, you all the pain in your body was you know, evaporated and you felt like a superhuman. But the next day, we'd call it the T train because the next day you feel like you were hit by a train. Wow. You know, everything comes rushing back. Um, and that was, they outlawed that because they said it exacerbated the, you know, the um, concussions, 
Sure. Uh, because the, and, your blood was so thin. that Right, know, and I'm just, sure that, you know, once you take a hit on top of the hit that you took last week, oh, yeah. it exacerbated the injury, whatever that injury may have been, right? Absolutely. Rotator cuff, whatever. Absolutely. Right? I got yeah. you. I mean, once you're – an NFL season is – an insane grind. You know, you're never you never have enough time to recover. There's never enough time to heal an injury. You're constantly just compounding injuries. By the time you get to week 12 and you still have a month of season left, you know, your body hurts so bad that you're you've just gone numb at that point. So, wait a minute. Okay, so you're listening in and again, thanks for tuning in and let's be blunt with my tell today, but I'm going to be really blunt right now. So, excuse me. What problem would I have with you if I'm tuning in on Sunday right now? I can leave this room that I'm in, go upstairs, there's a game on, turn in, and do I give a rat's ass if you are standing on the sideline with a joint in your hand? You shouldn't. I, I, somebody <laughs> tell me why would I be pissed off if you walked off the field? I just saw you get smashed. I mean, I was watching before we came down here. There's a game on right now. Yeah. And I literally – to, uh, there was somebody got hit, you know, that, that hit where the runner's running and you get jammed like full blown by the other guy right dead in the solar plex, boom. Yeah. And the person's body spins around and does almost a 360. Yeah. Kabang on the ground. Now, if I saw that player get up, because, you know, he got up slow and he ran over to the sideline, if I saw him stand on the sideline right now holding the vape pen, taking a big hit, before he ran back out on that field again, I would not give an F O. I would. I yeah. wouldn't matter bother me at all. Yeah. Because homie went over there to regulate so he could go back and take another hit that way. Yeah. So what right do I have to actually put my two sets in that, especially if I'm not the person taking that hit? I'm sorry, but no, let's get absolutely. back to the conversation. Do you feel like fans have uh, an adverse reaction to that? I don't. I don't know if I would hear a word out of any fan's mouth who said, oh, man, did you see him? Right. He just took a hit. It ain't going to be that way. Yeah, It's not going to be that way. Yeah, I, I, I you probably hear fans go, oh, he needs to take another one. Yeah, <laughs> take yeah. another hit. Take two yeah. seconds to shake it off. Yeah. What agree. the hell was that? I agree. I think from the fan's perspective, it's like, what's the big deal? Especially when the fan knows what you had just talked about, yeah. about the fact that the majority of the trainers or the, the you know, the, the, the doctors on the sideline are trying to figure out how quickly can I sneak a shot into him to get yeah. him back out of that field. Exactly. Exactly. And that's usually what's going on when a guy goes into the locker room right. and comes back out. Correct. He's getting a shot. He's getting some pills. He's right. getting something to get him back out there. Correct. You know, it's not like he, you know, Mr. Miyagi did it and put some, you know. He <laughs> rubs his hands together. Energy. Touch them, touch yeah. Them. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's not happening. <laughs> no, that's not happening. You know, so really it's about the owner's. It's about, you know, they have this idea from the time you get into that place, that, you know, that factory as a rookie, everything is about protect the shield. Right. And they have this massive campaign that's just blanketed over all the players of you are privileged to be here. You're lucky to be here. And everything that you do within these walls has to be about in the best interest of the league and your team rather well, than in the best interest of you. And the best interest of the league and the team is to have people playing on the field, making those ridiculous one-handed catches, yeah. running through five and six players and, 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 and making sure that they get the first down and making sure they score a touchdown. How you get there, if the choice is between Vicodin and a joint, yeah. shut the hell up. Yeah. I agree. Seriously. I mean, I cannot, I, 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 it, it just, it wipes me out. I've had maybe one conversation. I, I'm going to tell you the reason why you hear this anger in my voice is because I remember I was having a conversation with somebody who was saying, you know, I think it's really done. It's really stupid that these dudes, you know, they, that's the problem. All them opioids they're taking. They're taking so many opioids. They, they got to, and I'm thinking to myself, excuse me, you haven't seen a game in your entire life where <laughs> players have not been involved in opioids. And why should we be killing them yeah. for our entertainment? Yeah. It let I want to make sure I keep saying it over and over again. And I'm going to say, you know, I get to say, because we, we really are, I'm kind of like cable. 
So I'm on the internet, so it really doesn't matter if I say, fuck you. <laughs> if you think you have a right to tell a football player what his choice of drug is, yeah. if his choice of drug is so that he can entertain me, and I, I got to keep beating this to death, it's nothing more than entertainment. Mm. You know, and, I, and I, I, dude, I'm, I'm sorry that I, I, I bring it down to this lowest common denominator, but it's like you want me, the viewer, to have a smile on my face. And I'm going to have a smile on my face when I know my team won. Yeah. And when my team won, they won because there was a whole bunch of people out there getting the shit beat out of them mm -hmm. to make sure that they came out ahead. Yeah. And if now I know that the only way that they came out ahead was because – 90% of them have some form of opioid in their symptom, in their system, then I'm an asshole. Because if I think it's okay for you to have opioids in your system rather than having a little pot, then I truly am an asshole. Yeah. And we need to stop. Yeah. Stop for a second and remember again, it's not me talking here. You know, the United States government itself extols the virtue of cannabinoids as neuroprotectants in their abstract to their patent for cannabis. Yep. So if the U.S. government thinks that it can be neuroprotected, why can't they say to football teams, look, you know what, we recognize the neuroprotection in cannabinoids pre and post game. Let them smoke as much as they want when they get done. Yeah. And thank you for entertaining me today, by the way. You know what I mean? That's what yeah. should be said. Absolutely. No, I really appreciate your perspective, Montel, and I think that's a really important point, you know, because a lot of people in this discussion as well like to say, oh, well, these guys just want to get stoned, you know, these guys just want to be high, and it's like, well, I definitely, I would not go back and change anything. I loved the game of football. From the time I was a little kid, I dreamed of being a gladiator, being a warrior. Mm -hmm. And I was, I would put my body on the line again. That being said, though, I wasn't doing that so that I could have lasting mental damage for the rest of my life. Right. You know, I'll take the orthopedic injuries all day. I'll take the bad knees. I'll take the bad back, the neck, all the shit that I have to manage in my life after football, but don't tell me that I have to live with dementia when I'm 40 years old, right. you know? And a lot of guys are. I know I have good friends who have already been diagnosed with stage two dementia and Alzheimer's right. who are in their early 40s. Who, whether you want to argue it with me or not, argue away. Come on, send me some emails and say, Montel, you're full of shit. No, I'm not. Yeah. We know for a fact had... All of those players been using cannabinoids, they would have probably gotten the neuroprotectant that our government claims they get from it. They would have gotten that protection and lessened the opportunity to have dementia and Absolutely. those kinds of diseases later in life. Now, and you're right. Yeah. You said, I, I prefer to go ahead. It's, it's on me, the fact that I have neck injury or knee injury yeah. or hip injury. Well, it may be on you, my friend, but you have the right to be pain free. Yeah. Yeah. And if marijuana will lessen your pain, yeah. again, I say fuck you to anybody <laughs> who is going to say you don't have a right to do that. Yes, I appreciate I'm that. I'm not in your living room, man. I'm not in your house. Yeah. So when you're sitting at home alone in the dark, or not alone, but with your, your loved ones, but in the dark, and you know that, you know, I got to get up good time. Yeah. And that hurts? Yeah. How do I have a right, me, Montel, have a right to say, oh, no, you can't smoke a joint to feel a little bit better? Yeah, yeah. Shut yeah. the fuck up. Yeah. It's just so ignorant, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's time for it to change. You know? It is. That's why I think this whole thing, um, I'm just compelled to keep telling this story and keep saying it and keep putting it out there, and the science keeps backing mm -hmm. it up. And you see it every day. More and more guys are coming out of the league. We were talking about it before we came on. My my former college teammate, Rob Gronkowski. Sure. Talking about he started his own CBD company. Right. He's talking about how he used it, and he feels like it's cured his CTE, which a lot of people gave him shit for. But you know what? I believe that I'm in better shape coming out of my football career because I chose to smoke weed 
literally every day after practice, after that annual test, I was consuming cannabis basically as soon as I got home from that long day of work um, through you know, through the entire week, through the season, and I feel like I came out of my career in better shape than if I hadn't. And I bet you if we compare you to some who didn't, yeah, no we clear. can see the clear yeah. and definite differentiation. Yeah, there are a lot of guys in bad shape out there. A lot of my brothers are in really bad shape. You know? it, but, but again, and, I, and I, 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 you know, I went off there for a second, but, you know, how dare we have the right to say, you did a good job, but fuck you. Yeah, thanks for playing for, for 10 years for me. Yeah. And now go ahead. I don't give a shit what happens to you when you go home. How dare we do that? And, you know, I, 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 there, there are certain sports that, you know, I just think people need to just stay the heck up out of shut up. If you're mm. going to tune it in to make sure that you add to the ratings, yeah. and that means you add to the money that the owners are making. Mm -hmm. And that means that you're making sure that somebody's getting rich off this sport. We better make sure that we're paying attention to those we leave behind. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, so what do you think, my friend? I mean, over the next couple of years, I know that right now this is in the face of the NFL. Yeah. The NFL is having to deal with, like you just said, when Gronkowski holds a press conference, yeah. you know, and this has been the guy that we love. Remember, yeah. Gronk can throw a tie pod in, <laughs> into a washing machine, and everybody's like, I love that. <laughs> love that tie pod. You know, okay, well, yeah. how about throw a little bit of a uh, little hemp pod in yeah. there? You know, so, so when he puts it in the NFL's face this way, yeah. And, you know, I have this feeling, you know, I, I can't, I, I, I won't throw out his name, but you know we got a we got a guy who's defying, you know, uh, uh, aging and the whole nine yards still playing, and I'm looking Tom, at him, huh? Tom Brady. I'm just I'm not <laughs> saying, but I know that every now and then I take a look at the, his eyes when I see him, you know, at a event or you know, I know some of the celebrities that he hangs out with with in Hollywood Hard and take. not and not. One of the ones he's hanging out with has missed an opportunity to smoke a joint. So I'm just saying when he finally steps up and says, oh, by the way, I believe that the reason why I had the longevity that I had was because I also smoked a little bit every now and then when I was home alone with my, you know, my supermodel wife. Yeah. You know, we, we took a couple hits, and that's why I was able to keep playing. The league's going to have to say, you know what? Again, to all of those who are detractors, fuck you. Yeah, They're going to have to say it. The only way we're able to help keep these guys out here on this field playing this way for your entertainment yeah. is by allowing them to consume cannabis. What's the problem? Well... What can I do? What can I do even? I mean, I, I want to I help more. I think you you're know, doing we, it. You know, Marvin Washington... Yeah, you know Marvin? Marvin. Marvin is a love board Marvin. member of my cannabis company. Awesome. And... Um, you know, I I will step up and do whatever it is you guys want me to do. Tell me I'm there, man. You need me to come and speak at an event for you at the NFL, I will come and kick a door down. You know, I because I, that. I think that's what we need to have more people who say, Thank you for entertaining me and brother, what can I do to help you keep entertaining me? I love that, Montel. Thank you. Well, I think you're doing it first. You know, I think this everything you're doing, having people like yourself very high level celebrity personalities, people who are in the mainstream milieu speaking this truth, telling this message to the world is super important, you know, because for far too long, the American public has just been brainwashed into thinking this is some sort of back alley street drug. Right, we're, we're just stoners. You know? Right. Yeah. And the truth is, this is a very powerful, necessary medicine. It's Absolutely. an ancient medicine. You know, that really only in the last 70, 80 years has been completely destroyed. 1937, been, Marijuana, Marijuana Tax, Tax Act. Act. Yes. And people don't even understand that. It wasn't vilified because it was right. a drug. It was vilified because we were afraid that you couldn't check the seeds across state lines and wouldn't get the profit out of it that you wanted to get. Yes. And also, we pissed off a couple of guys like, you know, William Randolph Hearst, who was yep. trying to cut down every tree he could find, yep. knowing that hemp would make a better paper anyway. Yep. And people like, you know, uh, DuPont, DuPont, who were trying to make That's sure right. they textiles, man. Exactly. I mean, if, if it wasn't for the two of them, every uniform on the field on Sundays would, would be, be made from hemp fiber. 
No doubt. And would be more protective because it would probably alleviate some of the bruising and scratches and scrapes and things that are happening in your body anyway. No doubt. It's so crazy, man. No doubt. And this information is out there. Yes. This is not like we're just sitting here talking shit. No. This is real documented information all you got to do is look it up i mean i got to try my best to make sure every single one of my you know podcasts i give you people a little education but you know people don't understand that the entire revolutionary army was yeah. clothed in hemp fiber every yeah. tent every yeah. rope and every sail we've used up until 1940s and yeah. i'm saying 1940s even after it was made illegal you know yeah. the united states government required certain farmers in this country yes. to grow hemp so that we could resupply the ropes on our ships exactly so you know it, it's not like hemp wasn't a part of the foundation yeah of america yeah absolutely um i believe it was the war of 1812 mm-hmm. fought between the french and the british was fought over Napoleon and France cutting off the trade route to Russia, which supplied Great Britain with its most valuable resource, which was hemp fiber. Hemp fiber, absolutely. Hemp fiber, people don't get it. I mean, every the revolution, the, the Civil War, the North was clothed in uniforms made predominantly from hemp. The South had uniforms that was made with hemp and cotton. Yeah. But hemp was, remember, you know, we, we founded the West in covered wagons yeah. that had canvas. Yeah. Where's the word canvas come from? Cannabis. It comes from cannabis. <laughs> People don't get it. It's just really ridiculous that we could actually, you know, believe the lies because we prefer to have a foundation built around hate yeah. rather than understanding. Yeah. So coming back, I got to go back to the NFL, my friend. So yeah. I mean, you, you got a lot of brothers out there again this sun, this Sunday. A lot of fellow football players yeah. are out here this <laughs> Sunday that are taking the beating that they're taking yeah. that could literally be helped if, in fact, they were able and allowed to go ahead and consume cannabis after the game. And they were allowed to use CBD and some of the other components, CBN, to get some rest, to get some yeah. sleep. Some more anti-inflammatory, some yeah. CBG, making sure that they had the maximum anti-inflammatory yeah. effect that they could get from it. So they got to throw THC in there too, man. No question, you the know. THC has its own THC. THCA has its own profound anti-inflammatory yes. responses. Yes, and, and we know that. Is actually the component that they found that strips this amyloid plaque from brain cells. Mm-hmm. So the stuff that causes Alzheimer's, this amyloid plaque that develops on our brain cells, which football players are, their brains are laced with this Rife stuff. With. THC is actually the one compound that goes in there and cleans all that up. Correct. So that's another, you know, we can't just say that THC is, you know, the demon. No, you absolutely know. not. Absolutely. So. And we know that, again, because the body has its own you know, secondary sympathetic nervous system, that would you, if you will, call it that, a secondary sympathetic nervous system called the endocannabinoid system yes. that has receptors of CB1, CB2 that are in the brain and in the peripheral, you know, organs yep. throughout the body. Absolutely. We are made to consume this plant. Yep. And until we get out of the way of ourselves, we're going to continue to damage players and people like you who have done so much for us, you know, mm. giving us all you know, that thrill that we've all gotten on Sundays. And, you know, yeah, as we see, NFL is about to take over Europe. Yeah. NFL is about to take over Africa. I, yes. <laughs> dude, I, it just blows my mind that we will have the nerve to have, be a part of a conversation that tries to deny a player from using camp, cannabis. Yeah. cannabis. Yeah. It's really stupid. Well, sure. things are changing, I think, for the better. I think so. Well, and again, we've seen in the last year at least more, more and more players are coming out yep. and talking about it. So that's raising the profile. And the more and more they do that, I think the more and more acceptance they'll be. Yeah. You asked that question earlier about do you think fans approve on the sideline? Absolutely. Yeah. I don't think fans would have a problem at all, and especially if we just let it go. Yeah. Most fans. Most fans. Yeah, you're yeah. going to have a few of the yeah. idiots that yeah. out there that, you know, I mean, you're going to have some yeah. people who are going to say, no, 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 I'd rather them go ahead and be strung out on opioids. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Grandma. Thank you. 
Absolutely. No, well, look, man, thank you even for being here, man. Thanks for being a part of us today. Thanks, brother. Absolutely, brother. Thanks and I'm going to do whatever me. I can do to help. I swear I to you. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Make sure you tune in to another edition of Let's Be Blunt with Monta.